Welcome back to Proxy Number Buddy, and today we're going to be updating the top 10 Eldara units after the January balance data slate. So a lot has changed since the balance data slate. There has been some Eldar nerfs. Of course, some top dogs of the Eldari tournament scene are now pretty much dead. Not completely, but they're definitely not top 10 units anymore, that's for sure. And there's also been some meta changes. Dark Eldar are very good now. Necrons, of course, are top dogs now. It's no longer the Eldari, it's now the Necron Menace. And as such, there have obviously been some changes in which units are the best in the Eldari Index. So we're going to talk about those today. And of course, all of these are my opinions on which units are good. Now, I am going to consider a couple of different things, mainly the strengths of the data sheet itself, but also the place in the current meta, which is, of course, a very important thing to consider, especially since if you're playing competitively, you're guaranteed to see at least one of those top performing factions. And you know, more often than not, you are going to be matched against one of those top performing factions in tournaments and things like that. All right, so basically what we're going to do in today's video is we're simply going to rank the top 10 Eldar units from the Eldari Index and analyze them post-January nerf. Now, before we get into the actual top 10 proper, I am going to discuss some auto-includes that I think I'm not going to include in the top 10, just because I want to keep it interesting and I want to keep it different than you know, possibly what you guys may list in your own top 10s. Now, when I say auto-include, I basically mean that every single Elder list, whether it be casual or competitive, is going to include at least one of the following units. And these are basically going to be the units that are going to activate a lot of the synergies that the Eldar army has that are going to keep it going throughout the game. So, of course, the Farseer and the Farseer Skyrunner are pretty much auto-includes. They've been auto-includes since the beginning of the edition because of the ability to change a Fate Dice to a 6, making the Fate Dice mechanic a lot more useful. Again, if Farseers didn't exist, if they didn't have this ability, Fate Dice would be a lot less powerful. And of course, Guide and Fortune are very useful powers as well to have over the course of the game. Obviously, plus one to wound from enemy units is a very good buff, and also just rerolls to hit is very strong as well. Eldrad is also a character that is now basically a near auto-include, and the reason I say that isn't because of, you know, the Mind War kind of trick he can do. Because while that is a neat little trick, it's not going to make the character an auto-include. I think really why he's the auto-include, for those of you guys wondering why Eldrad is in this list, is because Doom is a lot more important now, now that the meta has shifted considerably and we're using other units in our army. Besides just units that are mostly going to be wounding on threes or twos with rerolls, so that plus one to wound is going to be a lot more important. You know, things like fire dragons and stuff like that, different aspect warriors are going to love Doom. And also, you know, just because of the fact that Eldrad does generate those extra fate dice, and of course, fate dice did get nerfed. So that is also more important. The Autark or Autark Waylooper, of course, to generate command points. This is always going to be a staple until they basically get rid of that ability. You're going to have an auto-include Autark in your army, which is great. You know, I think, you know, any army that can regenerate command points or has the ability to regenerate command points will be taking those units pretty much guaranteed. And for Eldar, the Autark is the way to do that. And of course, Fuegan is also pretty much becoming an auto-include because of his great ability to do damage to heavy targets. He's also, you know, pretty good at variable damage. He can also deal damage against heavy infantry because his weapon has two profiles. And he can revive himself. He's basically another Phoenix gem, and we all know how powerful that is. And, you know, pretty much all at a pretty low price of 115 points which does make Fuegan easily far and above the best Phoenix Lord and a staple in most people's competitive lists. All right, so now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the top 10 units in the Eldari Index. All right, so coming in at number 10, we have Dark Reapers. Now, some of you guys may already be kind of, you know, thinking, no, Proxy Hammer, you're an absolute nut. There's no way the Dark Reapers are good, and they're definitely not in the top 10. But actually, with the way the meta is looking right now, I think the Dark Reapers have finally come into their own because the top two armies are going to be Dark Eldar and Necrons. And guess what, guys? Dark Reapers actually are very cost efficient against both of those armies. So they have two different types of shots, the Star Swarm and the Star Shot Missiles. The Star Swarm, of course, is going to be strength 5 AP minus 1 with two shots. 
and damage 1. The star shot is going to be strength 8, AP minus 2, damage 2. And while that may seem like a weaker profile overall, it's actually really strong into both of those matchups. The star shot missile is great at killing venoms. It's almost, <laughs> just based on the stats alone, it almost seems like it's the perfect counter to venoms. The reason being is that it basically, on average dice, will pretty much kill a venom every single time. Not only does it ignore the stealth that the venom has, but it ignores cover. So even if the venom is benefiting from cover, it's still only going to get a 6-up save against the star shot missiles. And the star swarm missiles are really effective against dark Eldar infantry because, you know, you don't really need the extra damage, but the more shots comes in handy, especially against those units like Incubi, right, which are single wound targets. But not only that, but it's also pretty effective against Necrons. Because a lot of the Necron infantry that is meta right now, like Immortals, are single wound infantry. And also, the things they use for secondary objectives, like Scarab Swarms, are very susceptible as well to this kind of firepower. Now, that's not even considering the biggest draw to this unit, which is of course the Tempest Launcher. And Dark Reapers are the cheapest form of indirect fire that you can get in the Eldar Index, and they ignore negative hit modifiers. So they're always hitting on a 3+, plus minimum. And this makes them great at dealing with cheap and fragile units that are going to be out of line of sight. Things like Mandrakes... Swooping Hawks, Scourges, Crude Hounds, and all sorts of other units that are meant for scoring that are going to be out of line of sight and are maybe a little bit too cheap for things like the Night Spinner to be bothering with. So, of course, you're not going to probably be running Triple Night Spinner anymore because of its vast points amount, but you might still want to use one for utility even though its damage is not anywhere near cost-effective anymore. And this is where the Dark Reapers come in, because their damage is much more cost-efficient than that of the Night Spinner against most infantry now. And especially during the late game, if they get the opportunity to climb up ruins and benefit from Plunging Fire, which is a minus 1 AP, on top of their already pretty decent AP values. And of course, remember that Dark Reapers ignore cover. So that means that enemies are not getting that plus 1 to their save. So overall, I think that even though a lot of people are overlooking Dark Reapers because they weren't really meta before, there was a lot of better units in the Eldar Index, I think now these guys are really cost-effective, and especially against the meta armies, the Dark Eldars out there, and of course the Necrons, they're going to be worth their weight in gold. Alright, so on to number 9, we have Wind Riders. So Wind Riders are a pretty fast and aggressive unit that are really good at wiping out mech targets, especially off of objectives, they get full rerolls to hit. And they're able to score secondaries pretty well because they are very fast. Their shirking cannons are especially deadly and they synergize well with a lot of other things in the index. Including another unit on this list which I will talk about in a second. Now the thing about wind riders that I think a lot of people are missing is that shirking cannons are now all of a sudden much better. And again it harkens back to those new meta armies that are going to be evolving after January. The balanced data slate did shake things up quite a bit, and there's a couple of advantages that Wind Riders have now that other units that fulfilled the role before just didn't. So one of those is they have a solid array of damage two weapons. Again, the Shuriken Cannons are damage two, they're strength six, AP minus one, and sustained hits. Which means they're pretty cost effective into things like Canoptic Rates, which of course are, you know, Toughness six and Wounds four. So, you know, you're not wasting any wounds by hitting them with a three-wound weapon. And of course, yeah, they're still going to get their feel no pain, but if you throw Eldrad into the mix, they're wounding on threes, and hopefully that crypt deck will be very dead, so they won't be getting that feel no pain. So they do synergize well with anything that can help them wound, because of course they reroll all their hits. So that also includes Shroud Runners. So not only Eldrad, but Shroud Runners as well can give them a needed boost. Every six that they roll to hit is not only going to be sustained, but it's also going to auto wound. Another thing is that they're actually very effective also against Dark Eldar. So the reason being, they're not great in combat, of course, although they can be decent in combat with three attacks apiece, is that they are mounted. They're not infantry. So all the poison weaponry, all the splinter weaponry that the Dark Eldar have are going to be mostly wounding on sixes if it's a rifle or wounding on fives if it's a cannon. And that's pretty massive because the Dark Eldar are packing a lot of Venoms. Those things hurt against infantry, but they will bounce off of the Wind Riders just because of the fact that 
They're wounding on fives, which, yeah, they'll probably get one or two wounds, maybe one or two kills, but of course, that's not very cost effective. And of course, in return, Wind Riders, you know, a unit of three can do some significant damage against the Venom. And actually, if the Venom is unlucky enough to be on an objective, the Wind Riders, just three of them, will on average kill it because they have rerolls to hit, they're getting sustained hits, and that will often spell doom for the Venom, who's only going to get a five up save against it. So yeah, I do think Wind Riders are another one of those units that, you know, were kind of overshadowed before the balance data slate. And now because of the changes, they're going to basically come into their own and people are going to start including them in their lists once more. Coming in at number eight, we have Guardian Defenders. So of course, everybody knows by now that the Fate Dice of ours got nerfed. We used to be able to roll 12 Fate Dice. Now we only roll six in the beginning of the game. So Guardian Defenders are there to make up the difference. They are primarily an objective holding unit that generates Fate Dice when controlling objectives, which of course are much more in demand now. They have decent damage as well, and they towed a Bright Lance and Shirk and Catapults. Shirk and Catapults are nothing to write home about, but these guys do trade fairly effectively against things like Intercessors, you know, your basic tactical marine and things like that. They do a decent job at, you know, chipping them down. And of course, if they're in your back line with a Farseer, you know, Farseer's nearby or something like that, the Farseer can always use Branching Fates to make that Bright Lance auto hit on Overwatch, which is very strong as well. And also just, you know, they are very good at screening your backline as well as in the later game, moving up onto objectives and contesting the midboard. Because, you know, even though they are squishy space elves in the late game, there's not going to be as many enemies to shoot at them, to engage them in close combat. And because they have OC2, if they do survive into the late game, which they probably should if they're just in the backfield the entire game, unless your opponent, of course, targets them out, then they should be able to kind of grapple for those mid objectives a little bit better so yeah guardian defenders a pretty good unit now mostly going to be used for their fate dice generation but are also a pretty decent unit in the later stages of the game for contesting mid objectives and supporting your other units okay so i know i've said this before but storm guardians are actually good and i know some of you guys will disagree with me out there but they have made their way into competitive lists even before the balanced data slate, and I think even more so, they're going to show up in competitive lists now. And yes, I would rank them among the top 10 units in the Elder Index, aside from the auto-includes and some of the other units that we'll talk about a little bit later. So Storm Guardians are really good because they give the Eldar sticky objectives, which is going to be even more important now that our primary objective holders, like Wraithguard, have been nerfed. And I've actually personally had a lot of success with these guys, not only being able to screen your backfield on turn one and secure your own home objective, which is important because again, you know, you don't want to just leave your objective open in the backfield or, you know, maybe sometimes your Autark Wayleaper is going to have to do something else. So having a sticky objective is pretty useful, but they're also quite good at rushing the mid board. And especially if your opponent is unprepared for it, these guys can slide up a flank cap an objective and force your opponent to react to them or else that objective is going to be sticky and it's going to make it harder for your opponent to be able to take it. Now another thing about these guys that a lot of people don't realize is yes their combat is absolute garbage but they actually have good special weapons. Their range damage is not bad. At 12 inches they pack two flamers and two fusion guns. The fusion guns are exceptionally good especially with the detachment bonus of a reroll to hit and wound. And up close with the double flamer and double fusion gun, they actually do a little bit more damage on average to heavy infantry than Guardian Defenders do. And I know some of you may be thinking that's a little bit weird because, you know, well, Guardian Defenders have a Bright Lance. But these guys have two fusion guns, which, which, you know, mathematically speaking, is better at killing mech targets. Basically, you're getting two shots instead of one shot, and you're getting them at AP-4 versus AP-3. And the great news is, is that those fusion guns are just not going to allow a save, right? AP minus four means they're not going to get an armor save, whereas, you know, a Bright Lance will give them a six up in the open. Of course, if they're in cover, they'll get a five up. So even if that fusion gun is targeting a unit of Space Marines in cover, you're still more than likely going to be able to kill a couple of them. The Flamers are good. They're not going to do a whole bunch of wounds against heavy infantry, but they are good at tackling light infantry. Things like Crude Hounds and stuff like that that might be in the mid-board early game, 
they're pretty good at tackling and, you know, trading with. They do also just come standard with a 5 plus invul save because of the Serpent Scale platform, which makes them really cost effective at surviving against high AP shots like Plasma Weaponry, which is a lot more common than you would think. You know, a lot of players do bring, you know, Plasma Weaponry on their Space Marine squads to deal with other Space Marines, and Storm Guardians are just a little bit more resilient to that firepower, which means they have a greater chance of surviving in those early turns of the game against that specific type of firepower. But even if your opponent isn't bringing Plasma and maybe is bringing more Anti-Horde, you can always use the Serpent Scale platform as extra wounds to help you survive. So it does have two wounds. That means if you don't really need the Invul save, you can just get rid of that model right off the bat. It's basically like having an extra two Storm Guardians against damage one weapons. So yeah, overall, I think Storm Guardians are a vastly improved unit compared to the other units in the Index. Of course, in the beginning of the edition, Storm Guardians weren't a consideration because, well, we didn't really have to worry about objectives. But now, since the objective game is even more important for the Craftworld Elder, I think you're going to be seeing a lot more of these in people's lists in a utility role. All right, coming in at number six, we have the Fire Prism. So the Fire Prism is back, guys. And the reason being isn't because it all of a sudden became so much better. You know, it didn't get buffed necessarily. It's just that basically the other options in our army got indirectly nerfed with the Fate Dice nerf and, of course, the nerf to, you know, things like Night Spinners. So the reason this thing is so good is because it has a powerful anti-large attack that is Fate Dice independent. It has flat damage 6, and it gets an extra reroll to hit and wound, which means you don't need to spend extra fate dice on it, and we are going to be very strapped for fate dice. And something not a lot of players might be thinking about, but is just as relevant, is the emergence of the Necrons as the top dog faction, especially the Hyper Crypt Legion, which of course is going to be the top contender for competitive play. And of course, a favorite of the Hypercrypt Legion is the Monolith, which is a T-13 monster. Most of your Bright Lances and even your Fire Dragons are going to be just a little bit ineffective against it. Of course, needing fives to wound. Fire Dragons are, of course, much better at it than Bright Lances are. But, you know, a lot of our current meta lists have a lot of Bright Lances. And now that we have a lot of less Fate Dice to work with, it's going to be really hard to get through that T-13 2 plus save 4 plus invul right? So being able to basically still wound on a 3 plus and get two rerolls to wound if you need it is going to be massive, especially since the Fire Prism can also draw a line of sight to other Fire Prisms. The Monolith can't be everywhere at once. It's an extremely slow vehicle, so it really needs that Hypercrypt Legion teleport to be effective. However, do keep in mind that it is also towering, so your Fire Prisms, no matter where they are on the battlefield, can always draw a line of sight to it. Unless, of course, it's physically out of line of sight, in which case, you know, you're still not going to be able to shoot it. And, of course, that linked fire is going to come in handy. Now, the other cool thing about the Fire Prism, though, is it's also, you know, a decent anti-infantry platform. It doesn't just have anti-large damage. It can also do 2d6 damage, you know, 2d6 shots with blast, strength 6, AP minus 1, which doesn't seem great on paper, but it's better than, you know, just having the two lances. So if your opponent does bring the infantry hordes, you do have a tool against it as well. So it's definitely an Eldar unit that is going to be back in vogue in competitive play. Okay, so moving on to number five, we have Shroud Runners. So Shroud Runners were on my last top 10 list. I think they took the 10th place spot, but they're much better now. And I think you're going to see them a lot more in competitive lists. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this. So number one, they are a very fast unit with Scout. So they have Scout 9, and they're also able to move 14 inches a turn. They also, of course, carry pistols so they could advance and score on secondary objectives. They also have very decent anti-guard equivalent weaponry with the scatter lasers and also come with sniper rifles for that little bit of precision that you might need to take out a character every now and again. But I think the big draw to these guys is their mark target ability to give your units lethal hits against the target, which is a great damage multiplier, especially against those tough targets you're starting to see in the meta, right? The Necrons with their Canoptic Rates and their Satan Shards, and guys, those Satan Shards are nasty. And there are Hypercrypt Legion lists running three of these standard. They're basically mini 
avatars or many Yinkarns. So if you think about the Yinkarn and how tough that is to kill, think about three of those on the battlefield that are teleporting every turn and, of course, just wrecking face. It's really tough to deal with that. So having lethal hits, meaning that your small arms fire can actually do some damage against them, is quite a bit of a buff. And a much needed way of converting the weapons that are normally going to be harmless against the Satan Shards into a serious threat. Also, while not quite the selling point of the unit because it does make them awkward to move around certain areas of the board, their large bases do also allow them to screen very well, and they're very cost effective. Their only 80 points are the same amount as Wind Riders, and although they don't do as much damage themselves against mech targets, they are good at screening and they are more durable than Wind Riders are. At least the shooting, because they do get stealth, which is minus one to hit, and they do also have three wounds apiece with a 4 plus armor save and of course a 5 plus invul save at range, which is pretty good, right? Which means against high AP weaponry, they are going to be a little bit more survivable than the Wind Riders. And overall, I just think these guys are really good. They have a lot of synergy with a lot of the Aspect Warriors that we're going to start seeing in people's lists. And even Fire Dragons and stuff like that, giving Fire Dragons lethal hits may not seem like a great idea, but when you're carrying them in Falcons and you have multiple units of Fire Dragons, re-rolling the runes, but on top of that, they're getting a lot of shots. You know, 10 Fire Dragons do get 10 shots. You know, even a couple sixes in there to auto-wound is giving you a significant damage buff against a lot of the tougher targets in the game especially if you have to wound on fives. And again, the Falcons with Pulse Lasers and Bright Lances and Shuriken Cannons, it, it all just synergizes together. So I'm really liking Shroud Runners, and I'm thinking you're going to see, you know, at least a couple of units of these in pretty much a lot of competitive lists going forward. And of course, speaking of Falcons, we have the Falcon coming in at number four. So the Falcon is a fire support grab tank, and has pretty significant firepower for the cost, and of course a small transport capacity. This thing is only 140 points. It's a bargain. It has escaped a lot of the nerfs that the other grab tanks have taken over the course of the edition, and it has stayed the test of time. It's also a great damage boost to units inside of it when they disembark and you shoot at the same target. It does have the fire support special rule, so that means if the Falcon shoots at something, the unit that disembarks also gets to reroll wounds against it, which is very powerful on things like Fire Dragons. And of course, the Death Jester, which is also a great unit this edition, especially after the Data Slate. And yes, if you are running Fire Dragons with Falcons, you should consider running a Death Jester in the list and just throwing him in a Falcon and then just coming out, rerolling all the wounds and getting all the sustained hits. It's insane if you spike your rolls the right way. And... You know, something else I do want to mention about the Falcon. It is quite fragile. However, with the new GW ruling that you can disembark a unit after you come from reserve, this all of a sudden becomes a very good pick into flexible deployment strategies. So if you need to go against a certain army that relies on deep striking or alpha striking like the Hyper Crypt Legion does, you can put this bad boy in reserve. And come in later exactly where you need it. Now, of course, I'm not advocating you go triple Falcon, all deep striking, because, of course, you can't even really do that. But, you know, having one of them in reserve as a flexible option to bring into the board, you know, might not be a bad idea. And it's a good option to just keep in your back pocket against certain matchups. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you guys off on, because, of course, there's so many things you can do with a Falcon. I've had videos on this before, but, you know, you could even put a Solitaire in a Falcon, right, and it can come out and reroll wounds. There's just so many possibilities with this thing. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, with the Falcon, is that it's only 30 points more expensive than a Warwalker, and arguably has more firepower. Actually, just straight up, it does have more firepower, right? It doesn't have an additional Bright Lance, but it has that Pulse Laser and Shuriken Cannon to make up for it. And it also technically is tougher. It does have a greater toughness. It does have double the wounds that the War Rocker has. It just doesn't have that invul save. And of course, it doesn't have that minus one wound. But in a lot of scenarios, the Falcon does actually just straight up beat the War Walker in toughness value against certain weapons. So even though it is a fragile grav tank, you could use it to tank shock and contest objectives and things like that. It is still very fast and has numerable advantages over a Warwalker for, again, like I said, only 30 more points. So I think Falcons are going to be big in the competitive meta going forward, and you could expect to see people running a lot of these. 
And truth be told, we were actually seeing people run these things in trios even before the data slate dropped. So they are going to be very, very popular. And of course, we can't talk about Falcons without talking about Fire Dragons, my favorite aspect warrior in the entire index. Now, they've always kind of been my favorite aspect warriors, even when they weren't good by, you know, competitive meta standards, I still love them and I still wanted to make them work in some way, shape or form. But now they're absolutely fantastic. And it's funny because I've been singing these guys' praises for the entire edition. When the edition first came out and I saw Fire Dragons at 85 points, I was like, guys, they're back. Fire Dragons were back in my mind and they've never not been good in this edition. Now, were they as good as a Wraith Knight? Well, I don't think anything in the game was better than a Wraith Knight. Let's be real. But Fire Dragons are very cost effective and they finally have come into their own. Because I think now, alongside things like Swooping Hawks and Shadow Spectres, of course, they're going to be the meta aspect warrior for a lot of competitive armies. They have powerful short-range anti-large that is cheap enough to hit effectively against heavy infantry as well with high strength and AP. You know, strength 9, AP minus 4, D6 damage, but melt to 3. So they're auto-killing Terminators for every failed invul which is absolutely crazy for the points cost. Now, of course, these guys melt as soon as they come out of the Falcon or whatever, right? They're going to just melt to enemy shooting or just get stuck in combat and absolutely obliterated, but they're cheap enough to trade very effectively. And of course, another thing to account for these guys is that they do get rerolls of one to their damage. So they're actually really good for kind of baiting out fate dice rolls to see if you can actually just of course, sub in a reroll for a six. So I know this may not seem that great to a lot of you, but if you're actually rolling on the damage chart against vehicles and monsters and stuff like that, oftentimes, at least in my experience, I roll that dreaded one. And because they get the reroll of one on damage, you can just flip that to a six or flip that to whatever number you want to in your shooting phase with a fade dice, which is really good. Now, the other cool thing is if your opponent actually is, you know, kind of not careful with their monsters and vehicles, you can also overwatch with the Exarch. The Exarch has a very powerful fire pike, and if it's close enough, it's also going to be pretty good damage. It's only D6 plus 3 if you're in, you know, within 9 inches, but again, if your opponent's not careful, they can get zapped with this thing pretty hard. And of course, this unit is also just very efficient because it's getting a lot of rerolls, right? It's getting a reroll to hit because of your faction bonus or your detachment bonus, I should say. It's getting a reroll to wound because of that same bonus. It's also getting rerolls to wound of one against, you know, monsters and vehicles. And of course, if you come out of a falcon, it's just rerolling all of its wounds. So these guys are just really insane. Really cost-effective anti-large unit that trades well against almost every vehicle and monster in the game and can also trade very efficiently against Terminator equivalents and also mech equivalents. All right, so next is Swooping Hawks at number two. So Swooping Hawks, of course, are now, in my honest opinion, the premier objective unit for the Eldar in the entire index. And I say that with full chest, because I think Warp Spiders... A little bit too expensive now in my mind. I think they're still great, obviously. But, guys, that Phantasm nerf did hit them a little bit harder than other units because they are more expensive. You do want to protect them more. And Phantasm was fantastic with them. Being able to overwatch with them and then just Phantasm behind terrain was amazing. Now that they can't really do that reliably anymore, they're still good, but I think Swooping Hawks might be just a little bit better for the cost. Because there is a significant difference in the point cost, right? You're spending 40 more points for a unit of Warp Spiders. You're really not getting any more durability. Now, Swooping Hawks are extremely fast, and they have Sky Leap, so they can go back and reserve at the end of your opponent's turn and Deep Strike anywhere on the battlefield that they want to, which makes them fantastic at scoring objectives. So your opponent is always having to worry about where they're going to be the next turn. They also have decent anti-infantry weapons with lethal hits, and, you know, basically what that translates to is them being able to punch a few wounds on tough targets. Because they have those lethals, they can, you know, score a couple of extra wounds here and a couple of extra wounds there. You know, maybe a Satan Shard has one or two wounds left. Swooping Hawks can reliably, you know, force a few saves through, which can kill it, you know. 
which of course, depending on the circumstances, could straight up win you the game. So Swooping Hawks, a very, very effective unit for the cost. They're only 75 points. They didn't get nerfed. I actually predicted that they were going to get nerfed, but they didn't. And in fact, they're a unit that, you know, is now just stronger comparatively because they didn't really need Phantasm because they were just a cheaper unit in general and much more sacrificial. And really the only issue with these guys is their sculpt. So it can be kind of hard to get a hold of these because, you know, they have out of production metal sculpts and the fine cast ones are just absolutely awful. But, you know, if you can get your hands on a good set of metal swooping hawks, it's not that bad. I actually do think these guys look better than warp spiders for what it's worth. But in any case, Swooping Hawks are not going anywhere, and I wouldn't be surprised if you saw even more of them being run in competitive play. Okay, so before we talk about the number one spot, I do want to just quickly talk about some honorable mentions that I think are really great units, and we're really close to making this list, but there were a couple of you know here and there reasons why I didn't end up going with them. So starting off with Warp Spiders, I think, you know, just like I mentioned before, the nerf to Phantasm did affect them more than other units because they are very expensive. They're actually the most expensive Aspect Warrior in the Index, aside from things like Shining Spears, of course, and the Crimson Hunter. But, you know, Warp Spiders did take a big hit with the Phantasm nerf. You know, they can still be very effective, no doubt, but Phantasm did hurt them significantly. The Avatar of Kane is also on this list. Again, I didn't put him up here just because of the fact that I do think that the meta armies right now can pretty easily take them out. And if you look at the different combinations that the Dark Eldar army can pull off in close combat, and also that, you know, the half damage ability that the Avatar has now counts as a modifier, so units that ignore modifiers are going to just smash right through his defenses. And of course, you know, I know some of you are already thinking that the Avatar can survive against a unit of Incubi because of that half damage, which it's true, he can, but not if he's softened up with Dark Lances first, which, of course, are going to be there and be present in any Dark Elder list. So while he's definitely still the premier objective holder for the Eldar right now, because Wraithguard are definitely out, the Avatar of Kane is in, he is still vulnerable to a number of things in the game, and I just think he's probably not top 10. He's still really good, but probably not top 10 in my honest opinion. Especially since you're going to have to be a lot more careful with the usage of Fade Dice. And of course, the Avatar of Kane does require a lot of Fade Dice to work properly. The Death Jester is also a great model. Again, I mean, I mentioned the synergy with the Falcon. But also, the Death Jester was just good from the beginning, right? Nothing really changed with the Death Jester. You're probably going to be seeing Death Jesters more, but not necessarily because the Death Jester got buffed, but more so because, you know, Fate's Messenger got nerfed on things like the Spirit Seer. So that's really all it is. I think the Death Jester is still obviously amazing, though. However, with the increase in things like Fire Dragons and Shurken Cannons in our Eldar armies, I think the Death Jester's role might be a little bit crowded. The Solitaire is also a fantastic model. The only reason I would say that the Solitaire may not be, you know, quite to the level of other units in competitive play. And again, I think it's great. I think it's going to be in a lot of competitive lists. But that Phantasm nerf, right? The Solitaire is only a three-wound character. And while it does have Lone Op, the guarantee of being able to use Phantasm after you kill your target unit to get to safety is no longer there. It's no longer guaranteed. So, you know, 115 points for a Solitaire that doesn't quite kill its points value means it is going to be a harder unit to use, which is fine, again, but I do think it's one of those units that Phantasm did affect. Maybe a little bit more significantly than other units in the Index. The Void Weaver is also really good, and I think, you know, the ability to be, you know, Fate Dice independent to have that flat damage, but also be able to take out infantry is very good, and Battle Shock, of course, is a decent thing to have. You know, forcing Battle Shock chests is not the best thing in the world, but it is decent, especially against armies like Imperial Guard, which, even though we don't struggle necessarily against the Guard, being able to deny a Blob the ability to come back via reinforcements can absolutely clinch a game for you and, you know, allow you to be in a position to win it very easily. 
So it's definitely an ability that you shouldn't necessarily look down upon because, you know, even though it doesn't come up that much, it can absolutely win you games. Rangers are another great unit, and they're always great. We've always seen Rangers here and there, but they've never gotten the credit they deserve, and I think they deserve at least to be in the honorable mentions because of their great ability to screen and, of course, basically allow you to deploy safely in certain areas of the board. And they're very cheap. They're only 55 points, so they're easily expendable. They're very good at screening, and they can also score you objective points. So overall, a great, fantastic unit that you'll probably see at least one unit of in most competitive lists. Illich Nightspear obviously goes right along with them because he gives the unit loan op. The rerolls to wound isn't the greatest thing. It is good, don't get me wrong, but it's not the you know reason why you take Illich. It's really for that fantastic ability to give loan op to the unit, right? So they can't be shot at. They can be you know pretty much in line of sight of the enemy army, but untargetable essentially. Now, I do think this unit is another, you know, unfortunately, another victim of the Phantasm nerf. Before, if a unit deep striked or, you know, kind of, you know, even Inceptors, for example, deep striked right next to you, between the Ranger move and the Phantasm move, there was a chance that you could get outside of 12 inches. However, that's way harder to do now. So units like Inceptors or the Hyper Crypt Legion Stratagem that allows a unit to deep strike within three are going to be the absolute bane of Illic and his unit of rangers. So that is something you do still have to watch out for, which I think is one of the reasons why I chose not to talk about Illic. Still fantastic, don't get me wrong, but just probably not as powerful due to that Phantasm nerf. Okay, so those were the honorable mentions, and now it is time, guys. It is time for the number one top unit in the Eldari Index post-balance data slate. And of course, it couldn't be any other unit than Shadow Specters. <laughs> of course, it's Shadow Specters, the unit that is basically permanently unavailable to anybody who wants to buy them, and it's forcing us to 3D print or buy from third-party vendors. They're absolutely amazing, especially since the Phantasm nerf. They're one of the few units that actually just got better because they don't really need Phantasm all that much. Of course, they could use Phantasm, but they already get a 6-inch move after they shoot. So they can already shoot and scoot out of line of sight fairly easily. Now, on top of that, they're not ineffective at shooting. They're really powerful. Both of their single shots and their multiple shot weapon options, or you know, firing modes, I should say, are extremely effective against a wide variety of targets. And, you know, they do also double as an objective unit due to their great movement as well and are actually more resilient to indirect fire because they have stealth. So, you know, stealth and a 3 plus armor save means that most indirect fire units are going to have to spend a little bit more resources actually killing them. And by the way, just a little bit of fun math hammer for you guys out there who, you know, that's kind of your thing. And it's a little bit of my thing, I have to be honest. And being an Eldar player has really taught me the value of that. But you know, it's really hard to actually kill this unit with even significant amounts of indirect fire unless you have a lot of buffs. So really the only types of units that can kill these guys are things like Mortar Spam, right, from Imperial Guard, or the Wyvern, believe it or not. Even though Imperial Guard players absolutely hate the Wyvern, it's ironically really good against Shadow Spectres, and so are just regular mortars, right? But, you know, if you're talking about the bigger tanks, which do more damage, of course, you know, unfortunately, they're a little bit less cost-effective against those specters because of the stealth and because of the natural 3-plus save. So, you know, not that you want your shadow specters being shot at at all, but they are a little bit more resilient to indirect fire in the first round of the game. The other thing about shadow specters that I didn't quite mention here, but... They're also a really big contender to being able to deal with, <laughs> what do you know, the meta armies that are, you know, kind of swarming the tournament scene right now, which is Dark Eldar and Necrons. The Focus Lance is great at taking out things like Venoms because Venoms are toughness six, these guys are strength six, and they're dealing damage three. So every failed invul save is going to be three wounds, which means on average a unit of these guys should kill a Venom every single turn. Meanwhile, their blast weapons are really good against things like witches and incubi. And of course, because they have that six inch move, they can stay out of combat range 
for as long as possible. Against Necrons, they're really good at taking out Immortals because Immortals are single wound. So, you know, even though they are strength four, if you have the right buffs, you know, you have Shroud Runners to give them lethal hits or maybe Eldrad to give Doom to the unit, they can hit really hard against even things like Canoptic Wraiths, who normally would be pretty good at, you know, basically resisting the firepower of the Shadow Spectres. And weirdly enough, they just have a lot of good targets in both of those armies. Both the Dark Eldar and the Necrons have a lot of targets that are going to be a little bit susceptible to the Shadow Spectres, you know, either Disperse Shot or Single Shot. So yeah, these guys basically do it all. If you want range damage against tougher targets, they have you covered. If you want range damage against, you know, hordes of infantry, they have you covered. If you want objectives, they have you covered. They basically have everything. If you want to be, you know, command point independent, they have you covered because they don't really have to Phantasm that much, right? But they could if they need to, right? If you do need to use Phantasm or Fire and Fate to score an objective, it's available to you. And on top of everything else, they're actually the most durable. <laughs> it's weird saying this because they're an Eldar unit, but they're actually one of the most durable Aspect Warriors out of the entire lineup, right? They have a three plus save, which is the best save you can get as an Aspect Warrior. And they also have just a minus one to hit, right? So, you know, these guys are very good. And the greatest part is they never even got nerfed. Not a points nerf, not a rules nerf, nothing. These, these guys are just, just as good as they were before the balanced data slate. So yeah, you're going to continue to have these guys out of stock. Forge World is going to have their hands full trying to create more of these guys. And, you know, for those of you out there wondering how to get some Shadow Spectres, probably ask a friend to 3D print you some. Because I am on eBay every day searching for you know, a unit of these guys that maybe somebody doesn't know the value of or something, just trying to pick them up and I can never find them. So, you know, <laughs> you're better off just saying, forget that and just 3D printing it because really they're that good and they absolutely deserve the top spot in this list. All right. So in conclusion, as the mighty Wraith Guard Brick and Night Spinner Spam slowly fade into the shadows of competitive play, a new era of Aspect Warriors is upon us. And I even think that some of the other Aspect Warriors are going to be more effective going forward as well. I didn't even mention this because I still think they're not that good, but Howling Banshees comparatively got a lot better because they have fights first. And guess what hates fights first? Incubi. Incubi charging into something with fights first will always lose. And what do you know? Even though Banshees are objectively worse in every way, pretty much, than Incubi, that fights first does allow them to get the first strike on Incubi and actually kill them. Who would have thought? <laughs> Which, you know, actually, you know, I know they can still get shot at and stuff, but it's actually kind of funny that you can use Howling Banshees in a way to counter Incubi in the new Dark Eldar detachment. Even though they're still miles away from being top 10 or anywhere close to it, as a matter of fact. So yeah, I'm really digging this. I love Aspect Warriors. My first craft world ever playing an Eldar army was the Beeltan. I love their lore. I love what they do. I love the Aspect Warriors, how they're all different and specialized in their own ways. It's actually thematically my favorite type of list to run, especially, you know, Mech Eldar with Aspects. And I think that's kind of where the meta is headed. So I'm really excited for that because, you know, that's, you know, going back to my old Alma Mater, you know, my old original Beeltan Force in 5th edition, which was just Aspect Warriors and Wave Serpents. So it is really cool to kind of see that evolving and kind of, you know, pushing its way into the competitive scene more and more. Even though, you know, I did love Wraiths as well. Wraiths are my second love. You know, they're the second army I ever kind of started running for my Eldar. I, I love Wraiths as well. They're really cool. But, you know, the time of the Wraith, unfortunately, is ending. And the time of the Aspect Warrior is upon us. And the real question is, are you ready for it? All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you guys think. What is your top 10 units? Go ahead and put it in the comment section. I want to know what you guys are thinking as far as the best units in the Eldar Index after the January Balance Data Slate. There is, of course, more content, more Eldar content and Dark Eldar content, of course, because we can't, you know, we can't leave out our Dark Cousins, especially now that they have this new detachment. So more content to come on both Eldar and Dark Eldar and 
Once again, thank you to all my patrons and supporters for supporting the channel over the last year. Your help has greatly improved the channel and helped it grow significantly. If you do want to help support the channel and join our channel's Patreon, I do have free trials activated, which will grant you permanent access to our Discord community, whether you continue the trial or not. And basically, our Discord community is made up of a great selection of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategies, tactics, and of course, hobbying. I'm also very active on the Discord and love to talk to players all the time about different strategies and tactics and lists. So if you need any advice or help, you can definitely reach me on there and I will always be available to help you. Because of course, every time an Eldar player comes back home with a W, it is an absolute win in my book. So yeah, if you want to join our Discord community, it's a great place and you should definitely consider it. I'm also an Amazon affiliate and have a channel store page, so if you want to grab some discounted Eldar miniatures on Amazon or some Eldar-inspired apparel on the channel store page, I will leave the links for those in the description as well as, of course, the link to the Patreon. All right, everybody, that is going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching once again, and have a great rest of your week and some great games this weekend. Have a good one, everybody. Peace out.